connections between neurons would take place and his his concept of cell assemblies of lots of neurons coming together which is now being thought about again in some of the engram cell work and uh, soon after that came the first neural network models to incorporate synaptic plasticity within specific networks and the photos include pictures of Konorsky, Hebb and David Ma who tragically died uh, very young. Now some of the first experimental evidence for this idea came actually in Ecclesia, the work of Eric Kandel and his colleagues. But when we turn to mammals, um, then I think that uh, the field took a new direction forwards following the discovery of long-term potentiation. First in the rabbit as reported by Bliss and Lomo in 1973, and then the development of the slice preparation and all manner of studies that gave us a deep understanding of what might be happening when synapses changed in strength. Here's some data of LTP in the human brain uh, from a paper published some years ago using tissue extracted as part of surgery for epilepsy. So we're looking at something that isn't some peculiarity of rodents, um, it seems to be something that's widespread in the mammalian brain. Now this long period of work with slice preparations uh, uncovered the variety of different uh, glutamate receptors uh, the AMPA, NMDA, and MGUR receptors. And we now do have a fairly sophisticated understanding of what's going on when transmitter is released from the presynaptic terminal onto the postsynaptic neuron and the circumstances in which the NMDA receptor may become activated. As everyone I think knows, it's normally blocked by the divalent cation magnesium, but under circumstances of depolarization, such as would happen with cell firing in a kind of Hebbian framework, uh, that results in the entry of calcium molecules, which then activate signal transduction pathways within the postsynaptic neuron and may change such things as AMPA receptor trafficking. Of course, it's a very complex process. Many molecules and proteins are involved, and I don't want to go into those details, but I did at least want to establish the idea that a triggering event might be NMDA receptor activation and an expression event might be changes in AMPA receptors. There are also changes on the presynaptic side. So this is captured in this nice cartoon from Morgan Chen, where the idea is that in a basal state, there are a certain number of AMPA receptors which are trafficking in and out of the postsynaptic density, but that under circumstances of potentiation, there's an increase in the, in the number of these receptors, as you can see in the top um, right-hand diagram, and in long-term depression, a decrease of them. So that is the sort of basic model that people have of the way in which synaptic plasticity may come about. But it's all very well looking at it just at the synapse level. We also have to uh, consider in some way, what might this mean with respect to memory formation? And um, although the theory was in no sense mine or that of my colleagues, I did write a review some years ago with Steve Martin in which we tried to write down the idea that activity dependent synaptic plasticity to distinguish it from say lesion induced synaptic plasticity is induced at appropriate synapses during memory formation and is both necessary and sufficient for the encoding and trace storage of the type of memory mediated by the brain area in which that plasticity is observed. Now one of the points of emphasis here is to think about these synapses being embedded in different circuits in different areas of the brain and I think we now have a much better mathematical understanding of what might happen in a simple reflex network where a particular input gives rise to an output and the consequences of that plasticity would be just to make the output bigger and the consequences of depression would be to make the output so smaller and that was typically studied in the ecclesia models but if you have a distributed associative network so you're embedding exactly the same plasticity but into a different system then you get different properties and those different properties include the possibility of developing associations between one cue and another, such as between an event and the context in which it happens. So I think one has to think not just at the synaptic level, but also at the circuit level to get a sophisticated understanding of what this plasticity is going to achieve functionally. Now, there's been a lot of work on distributed associative memories, extremely important work by computational neuroscientists. But I want to make is the point that in the hippocampus, which is uh, my sort of favorite brain area, the um, arrangement, the anatomical arrangement um, of this structure shown here in a Golgi preparation in the uh, bottom left 
um, is indeed one that is very similar to that of a distributed associative network. Now, the different regions of the hippocampus, like dentate, gyrus, area, CA3, area, CA3, have important and differences in the way their architecture works out. And we now know from a variety of different experiments, both in rodents and in humans, that these different areas of the hippocampus may perform different functions, like separating patterns, which we think the dentate gyrus plays an important role in doing. And then by, by virtue of the re-entrant circuit, circuitry of CA3, the possibility of pattern completion and the learning of sequences. And then by virtue of the direct layer three input to area CA1, the stratum molecular molecularis, then the possibility that events processed through dentate gyrus and area CA3 may then be associated with spatial information coming in from entorhinal cortex. So that's the kind of intellectual framework I have as I approach doing specific experiments. But how would we go about testing the synaptic plasticity and memory hypothesis? Well, what Steve Martin and I tried to identify was a set of different sorts of experiments, which we call detectability, antrograde alteration, retrograde alteration, mimicry, and so on. And the idea was that if the SBM hypothesis uh, is one that is worth taking seriously, it has to be a testable hypothesis. And therefore we have to see first, does learning actually result in synaptic potentiation? If we block LTP induction, do we impair memory information? If we allow learning to happen and then induce LTP afterwards, scrambling as it were this distributed network, do we impair memory recall? Now there's now quite a lot of data, a lot of it in hippocampus, but also in amygdala and also in motor cortex, indicating that these three criteria have been met. And my own lab devoted about 15 to 20 years worth of work to uh, try to really zero in on those particular issues. What we left undone is the mimicry issue, the idea that you might artificially induce synaptic potentiation or depression in some spatial pattern, and this gives rise to an apparent memory, for something that may never have happened. Now, that was not really possible using the technologies we did have, but some of the new optogenetic techniques offer the opportunity of approaching this important criterion as well. Okay, so what I want to do in this talk is of course to present some relatively new work, uh, but against the background of the framework that I've tried to give you. And one of these projects is a project I call Silent Learning, and the other, other has to do with novelty associated enhancement of what we call everyday memory. Now before I go into those experiments specifically, I just want to um, uh, diverge slightly into an element of, um, of, uh, of psychological thinking, uh, which is also the background of the kind of experiments we do. And this theoretical position has to do with what I call the automaticity of much memory encoding, the automaticity. Now, much learning is deliberate. If you think of children learning their tables in primary school, they're engaging in a very deliberate form of learning. It's difficult for them. It requires them to concentrate and give concentrated attention to the task that the teacher's making them to do. And um, their ability to learn, say, their tables won't be achieved unless they join in, as it were, in the class and have the intention to learn. And this is a major motivational issue for teachers. But I put it to you that in contrast, so much of everyday human memory just happens, apparently without any effort. We remember things that we don't intend to remember. We just remember them. So provided information about a stimulus or some event or action commands our attention, it's gotta be downstream of attention or filters, then there'll be some level of processing without regard to whether that information is surprising or unsurprising, without regard to whether it's rewarded or not rewarded. And um, it, it, a good example would be remembering breakfast today. And so, so I invite all of you to think back to what you had to breakfast today. And I'm assuming that all of you can remember. It was probably a quick coffee standing up or something like that, I don't know. But um, it wasn't as if when you had breakfast this morning that you said, oh God, I've, I've got to remember this because 
there's going to be a speaker in the afternoon who's going to test my memory for breakfast. It just happened. And um, so I, I think there is a contrast between this intentional and automatic forms of memory processing. Both are cognitive. Um, but I think much of everyday memory is more of this kind of automatic kind. Now, there's a cost to this. First of all, the value of storing everything for a while is that the memory encoding and storage system does not have to make decisions on the fly about what's worth keeping and what's not working. You just store everything for now. And David Ma, in his great paper about uh, hippocampus of, of, gosh, 50 years ago, uh, makes the same assertion. Now, the risk, of course, is that the system then becomes saturated with too much information, an experience all of us have after a busy day. But I put it to you that forgetting comes to the rescue. Because if information is first stored in a long-term memory system that's subject to loss, i.e. prior to consolidation, and that there's trace decay, interference, and so on, then with luck, if everything's if it's evolved uh, effectively, then um, the system won't get saturated. So I put it to you that forgetting is the sort of flip side of this and forgetting is a really good thing. Without it, we'd all be in real trouble. And in fact, I had the privilege of giving a TED talk at, of all places, the Matadero in Madrid, uh, in which I talked about how important forgetting was. Now, there is then a period of time in which we're holding on to information which will get lost. There's some sort of time window in which selective retention can occur, and that is the functional point of what I shall go on to talk about as synaptic tagging and capture. Okay, so let me come into the silent learning uh, experiment. Here's Hebb's postulate. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite or repeatedly tis consistently takes part in firing it, some growth or metabolic change takes place, such as A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. Okay, we all know that basic claim. Now, what I want to put to you is that, not that that statement is wrong, I don't think it is wrong, but that it may well be um, a special case of um, the circumstances in which learning actually does take place. And my starting point in telling this story is a paper published from Nelson Spruston's group when he was then at Northwestern University. He's, he's now, I think, at uh, Janelia, if I remember correctly, in which he did um, some very interesting brain slice experiments in hippocampus, in which he explored a, a recording uh, from CA1 cells, as you can see from the recording electrode here, um, and activating stratum radiatum or stratum lacunosum moleculari. And uh, what he did in these experiments was in one condition, he spritzed on TTX very close to the cell body. So that would silence the cell body. And what he found when he did that was that he got just as much LTP in stratum lacunosum moleculari um, as he did when the cells were permitted to fire. Now, on the face of it, that's a very surprising result, but I think it's an extremely interesting one because it raises all sorts of questions about the necessity of this cell firing, which Spruston goes on to explore further in later experiments. So I found myself thinking about this and wondering whether, whereas for memory retrieval, serial firing is required because you need to pass on a message from a bunch of cells to the next set of cells, to the next part of the network. So I make the assumption cell firing is required there. There's some caveat with respect to reconsolidation, but let's not worry about that for the moment. But with respect to memory encoding, synaptic plasticity may be required, but cell firing may not actually always be necessary. So the fire together, wire together, right, may be an oversimplification. So how can we go about investigating that? Well, unfortunately, we can't spritz on TTX just onto neurons in behaving animals. So we have to do uh, start with some sort of Mickey Mouse experiments, which um, 
which may not tell us in detail about mechanisms, but they might establish uh, uh, whether the, this is going in the right direction or not. And so we decided to try looking at the impact of extremely low doses of muscimol, so 0.19 uh, molar, uh, uh, millimolar rather, sorry, it's a typo there. And um, uh, we began with some physiological experiments in which we simply stimulated, in this case, the dentate gyrus, but we could have worked in CA1, it doesn't really matter very much, and looked at the impact of muscimol, the NMDA receptor antagonist AP5, and the AMPA receptor antagonist CNQX. And if we start uh, at the top in, in, in panel A, what you can see is that the EPSP does go down a little bit with this low dose of muscimol, but not very much. Uh, it's about 35% actually. Um, with APV, there's a transient change, but in no time at all, everything's back to baseline. And with the CNQX, um, uh, the EPSP is lost. So that's kind of roughly as you might expect. Now, if we looked at the row C, what happens to the population spike? Well, what we did in our pilot experiments was to keep titrating the dose until we got to a point where we got cell firing uh, lost with the muscimol. So as you can see, it's down within about 20 minutes or so. If I move my pointer here at this, this region here, and it stays down for about an hour or so before it goes back up to baseline. And the same, of course, happens with CNQX. So what we've got is a window of time here shown in yellow when we can do some behavioral experiments where we can have some confidence that the cells are not firing, but there are still an EPSP. So we've got to sort of first base in what we're trying to do in this behavioral experiment in a moment. Now, the second part then is to ask, well, okay, the EPSP is smaller in the muscimol group, but what about LTP? And I was delighted to see that when we tried to induce LTP, we had perfectly normal LTP. So the cells are not firing, the EPSPs are down a bit, but synaptic plasticity is intact. Now that's not true for AP5. And you can see here, there's absolutely no LTP at all. So the AP5 is not really a drug we're interested in it, but it serves more as a sort of control group as it were to establish that our procedure for inducing LTP is actually blocked by a standard antagonist. But while one might have expected it to be blocked by muscimol, it wasn't. Now, we also were concerned with the issue of the spread of the drug through the hippocampus. And in the initial experiments, the drug infusion and the recording um, were close together. But in later experiments, we had the drug infusion a full 2.5 millimeters away from the recording electrode. And even under those circumstances, you can see the muscimol produced a, a near complete blockade of population. We in fact use quite large volumes of infusion deliberately in order to uh, cover the whole of the dorsal and the intermediate hippocampus. Okay, so now let's go to the behavior side. So we turn to our old friend, the water maze, but using it in a slightly different way from the way in which many people have done in the past. So what we've got is a series of about 50 sessions in the water maze, um, but they're grouped into sets of three. And the protocol is one where the position of the escape platform in the water maze changes from one day to the next. So again, using my arrow, it's up here in the Northwest on session one, it's moved down to sort of almost at the south in session two and moved over towards the east in session three. So here it is session one. Here's in red where it was in session one, it's no longer there. And uh, in session three, uh, here it is now in session three and where it was the day before. Now the other thing is we use the so-called Atlantis platform, which is a platform which sits at the bottom of the pool, which the animals can't climb onto until it's raised to a point being within one centimeter of the water surface. And so after 60 seconds, we raise the platform and the animals could then um, get out of the water. So uh, in this procedure, what we can do is at the beginning of session two, we can ask, can you remember yesterday? And at the beginning of session three, we can say, can you remember yesterday? 
So what we're doing at the beginning of each session is asking about recent memory from 24 hours ago, and then we're in the further trials of that day teaching them something new. So the behavioral protocol separates out retrieval and encoding in, 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 a, in what I hope is a clean way. Now, many of you have seen The Water Maze, and um, I apologize for showing this movie yet again, but it does, I think, illustrate how the thing works and the particular behavioral measure we're going to be used. Here's a well-trained animal swimming over to a platform that's available, climbs onto the platform. No great surprise. We're tracking in real time. We now push this platform down to the bottom. It's held by an electromagnet at the bottom of the pool and now run a probe test. This is the first time this rat's ever had a probe test. And the question is, has he, over the number of training trials, learnt where the platform is located? The inset shows the tracking over time. And I hope you're persuaded that this rat's pretty good at remembering exactly where to go. And we can accumulate the time spent in these annually, these artificial annually, um, as a measure, as a quantitative measure of the extent to which he can remember uh, the correct location. So um, we're now going to uh, report the results. And um, I just want to emphasize the, 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 the sort of twist in this experimental design. So the idea is we've got session one, session two, session three. We then have some control sessions, and then we do another session one, session two, session three, up to about 50 sessions. And it's a within subjects design, so we can give various different drugs and see what happens. And the drugs are always given on session two. So they're infused directly into the hippocampus, the same large volume as we used in the physiology. And what we're gonna do is ask the question of what's the impact of this drug on the ability to remember what happened on session one and to encode new information on session two. And then we let the rug wash out. And on session three, we're asking on session three, can you remember what happened on session two as well as can you learn something new? So it's a kind of um, sort of dominoes type of experiment. And this is the key finding of the paper. So, it turns out that in terms of the size of the pool and the, the area that we're tracking in, that the chance level of searching in the correct zone is about 4%. And when we infuse artificial CSF, what we have is a value of about 9 to 10% with fairly tight standard errors, which are all highly significantly above chance. So the animal, just as you saw in the film, can swim around the correct position. On session two, he's looking at where the platform was on session one. On session three, he's looking where it was on session two, and so on. Now, in the case of our drugs then, let's start with the key drug, muscimol. We're going to infuse muscimol on session two. And lo and behold, on session two, the animal cannot remember where the platform was on session one. That's great. The cells are not firing. We would not expect memory retrieval to be intact. But even though memory retrieval is not intact, if we've got our doses right, the animal is still in a situation in which LTP can occur. So even though we can't see it on session two, maybe the animal learns perfectly well where the platform is in the four trials of that day. Now, if that's the case, then when we go to session three without the drug, allowing retrieval to happen, he should be able to remember session two, and indeed he does. So that's the central result. Um, we call this silent learning because on session two, he can't show us what he's learning. It's not till session three, he can display this to us. Now, pleasingly, APV shows the opposite effect. I won't take you through why that's the case, but um, it's, it's, it's a following on from the particular properties of the NMD receptor and with CNQX you get no memory on either session two or session three. And uh, we can look at the particular paths that the animal take, and you can see in the muscimol animal, the animal's swimming all over the pool, but he does eventually get to the platform, and then he has three more trials, and the next day he swims across that position, even though the platform's new to new, to new location. So that's our silent learning, and we can quantify that, but let's not worry about that. So where are we? We've not allowed the cells to fire. But I've tried to present to you evidence that even though the cells are not firing, learning may well be taking place. So 
I, I'm not saying that Hebb's postulate's wrong. Uh, I, I'm saying that it, it maybe is not completely inclusive. And I think that follows directly from the fact that McNaughton's cooperativity principle requires only that there's sufficient po postsynaptic depolarization to allow NMDA receptors to function. You don't necessarily have to have cell, cell firing. So let's go back to Nelson Spruston's paper. Remember, he spritzed on TTX and stopped the cells from firing and got perfectly normal LTP. Well, what did he write about? Well, he said, although we used somatic TTX application to prevent action potential initiation of backward, a similar situation may occur normally if the soma is inhibited while the dendrites are excited, such as during the hippocampal theta rhythm. So he's suggesting in his discussion of this paper that while he's using a sort of slightly strange procedure, an experimental procedure, TTX, he's nonetheless looking at something that may actually happen normally. Now, there's been a lot of follow-up uh, from the original 2002 paper. Spruceton himself did further work on dendritic spikes. Uh, Matthew Larkin working in cortex. Um, uh, Bittner and Jeff McGee are talking about behavioral timescale synaptic plasticity for the formation of CA1 place fields, which occurs again without cell firing. So I think that there are situations that we need to take account of whereby the dendritic computation may be sufficient for learning to actually take place. And Matthew Lycombe writes about this in his, in his Tim's article. Now, I'm acutely aware that this is a really Mickey Mouse experiment in the sense that Muscomol is no model for the exquisite subtlety of inhibition. And we were hearing earlier from Dr. Barrow about you know, the beautiful uh, uh, techniques, the genetic techniques for targeting PV and CCK neurons and so on. And so, you know, I, I, I present this with the utmost modesty. Um, and I realize that, you know, the wonderful work of Peter Somerji and others who've looked at different facets of, of, of inhibition here. Um, but, um, but there we are. So, what about the keeping of memories? In the last part of the talk, I want to go on and talk about selective consolidation. So, um, we've long known that protein synthesis is necessary for long-term memory. And we have this distinction between decaying early LTP and long-lasting protein synthesis dependent late LTP. And that raises all sorts of questions about uh, the role of the post-translational and the translational component of LTP. But it also raises a targeting problem because if the plasticity proteins are generated in the soma, how do they find their way to the relevant synapses for stabilizing those synapses? And even if there's dendritic synthesis of plasticity proteins, which uh, many people are interested in now, particularly the work of people like Aaron Schumann in, in Frankfurt, um, there's still, uh, an, unless it's localized to a specific, um, a, a, a den, a specific dendritic spine, there's still also a targeting problem in a particular domain of the dendrite. So uh, one way in which this could be done was suggested by uh, Julie Fry and myself, which is our concept of the synaptic tag. And the notion is that some change happens at the synapse that not only is associated with the the potentiation of synaptic strength, but also setting a tag which can then capture the plasticity proteins which would otherwise travel diffusely on the Canes and motor system. Okay, so uh, the evidence that lay behind this came from some brain slice experiments that I did with Julie Fry and were published a long time ago, in which he had a preparation in which um, um, one could um, look at LTP over many hours, six to eight hours, and here you can see late LTP on pathway S1 and no change on an independent pathway S2. But that if you infuse inesomycin um, at the time of the LTP induction on both pathways, both of them decay back down to zero. So that's great. We're looking at the protein synthesis component of LTP on both pathway S1 and S2 in this case. However, if you delay the presentation of anisomycin such that it's only present during the activation of pathway S2, then you would expect pathway S1 to show late LTP, which indeed it does, the open symbols. But you might say, well, in the case of S2, we've got anisomycin there, so we shouldn't see late LTP, but we do. But we do. So um, late LTP is protein synthesis dependent, but paradoxically, it can be induced during the inhibition 
the protein synthesis. So what might be going on here? Well, in order to investigate this further and to be sure of the phenomenon, we set up slice rigs in Edinburgh and together with a wonderful Spanish student, Roger Redondo from Tarragona, um, we looked at late LTP as you see here with strong tetanization and weak LTP as well, uh, which decays back to baseline. And by having a baseline for a full um, uh, eight hours, uh, we could see that in the case of weak tetanization, you might get LTP after one hour, but it bows that down to baseline after 10 hours. And that's the critical observation. And we could actually measure the decline over time. But when you put those two together within about 40 minutes of each other, the weak pathway continued to show late LTP. So the model that we presented was the idea that we need to think about not only the glutamate receptors, but also uh, neuromodulatory inputs uh, to the hippocampus, uh, such as the dopamine input. And perhaps what happens with strong stimulation is it activates these neuromodulatory pathways also, and that gives rise to the synthesis of the plasticity proteins, which are then captured by the local tags, the blue tags in the cartoon. But in panel B, what we have is weak stimulation, which is not sufficient to activate this catecholaminergic pathway. So we set a tag, and then after a, way, after a while, it resets, and you get this decay down to baseline, as I've shown you. But that if you have the two together, then the weak pathways tag hijacks the plasticity proteins from the strong one, and there's a sort of synergistic influence between the strongly stimulated and the weakly stimulated, such that the weak pathway can show a stabilized LTP. Now, the idea that dopamine receptors might be involved in uh, late LTP and in spatial learning, uh, Charo kindly said I was an early person in that. I mean, the truth is that she was. And in this particular paper uh, with Granado published in Cerebral Cortex in 2008, they produced some really beautiful data from uh, D1 knockout animals showing that they get much less LTP over um, a five hour period, as you can see clearly in this slide. The paper goes on to talk about the impact on spatial learning as well, uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that the importance of D1 receptors for late LTP is certainly not any discovery I have made and one where the Carl Institute has played a very important part. Now, a little aside just for a moment, I know time's running out, but I've got about seven minutes left, I think. Certain events are very well remembered by the particular generation and geographical locale for which they're important. Uh, my mum never stopped telling me about all the things she did on VE Day, the day that the Second World War ended and all the parties that they were having in the place where she lived. I'm just old enough, only just, to remember the assassination of President Kennedy, and I remember exactly where I was on that day. Um, then there was the assassination of John Lennon, perhaps uh, less striking, it depends whether you're a music lover or not. Princess Diana's death, I was in Sacramento in California, I remember the hotel well. 9-11 uh, too, and then of course the train bombings on, on Theane in Madrid. And there are other events since uh, that will be important for the new generation. Now, for me, the important feature of these memories is, of course, the tragedies such as in 9-11, but also that we have a very good memory of many of the trivial events of these days, events that would ordinarily be forgotten. And I want to try to make an analogy between that and these physiological experiments I've been talking about, because the textbook dogma is that if you only weakly stimulate something, then it's forgotten easily. But what I've shown you is that if you weakly stimulate something in a time period where something strong has also happened, then the weak memories will get remembered also. And I make an analogy between that and flash bulb memories. So we flip away from the water maze now into a new piece of apparatus that we're using, which enables us to do physiological recording, which is hard in the water maze, called the event arena, in which rats run around and dig in sand wells to find food. And we call these events. An event one happens in one place on one day, happens in another place on another day, and another place on another day, exactly like the movement of the platform in the water maze of the experiment I've described. So that's the behavioral task. And when we do that, what we find is that, let me turn off my telephone, forgive me. Sorry, folks. Um, 
what we find is that if we look at memory after 30 minutes or after 24 hours of trying to remember where a Sandwell was located, then what we see in the bottom panel is that there's very good memory after 30 minutes, but it's all gone after 24 hours. So we're looking here at these sort of weak, unimportant memories, the everyday memory stuff that you forget every day. So that's the idea. Um, and the analogy here, I think, is with the weak LTP that I've shown you earlier. You have a weak tetanus, it decays back to baseline over eight to 10 hours. And if we look at the LTP after 30 minutes, you can see it's really good, but after eight to 10 hours, it's gone. Just as in our memory experiment, we've got good memory at 30 minutes and no memory at 24 hours. But now what we want to do is to give these rats a very surprising experience. And we need to do it after memory encoding, not before, because we don't want to look at sensitization effects. And we do this using just a large Perspex box, which has interchangeable floor surfaces. So we can use it several times here, just shown with paper, but it might have ball bearings or Lego or, or rice or tea leaves or what have you, all sorts of surfaces, which rats as they're walking across will find surprising. So when we do this, and we do it 30 minutes after encoding, now the, sand, the correct sand will in a new location, what we find is that after 24 hours, the animals can remember this location of this sand well perfectly well. So this novelty has upregulated something that enables this weak memory, ordinarily forgotten, to be sustained. And our supposition is that what this novelty is doing is um, upregulating immediate early genes, which then cascade down to uh, result in the synthesis of plasticity-related proteins. So we went on and did experiments in which we uh, explored the impact of blocking D1, D5 receptors. Uh, uh, the Moratella experiment had dissociated D1 and D5, but using Shearing 23390, we were using a broad spectrum D1, D5 antagonist and also anisomycin. And what we found when we did that, and I won't present the results, is that this novelty effect disappears. Now this pharmacological data doesn't tell us about the source of the dopamine. So in the final uh, minute or two, I'll mention that we have gone on to do optogenetic studies in which we look at activation of dopaminergic and noradrenergic neurons with uh, which have, have viral expression of channel rhodopsin in TH Cree mice. So the experiment is essentially the same, except that we now have um, virus in VTA and virus in LC and optic fiber implants so that we can selectively activate VTA or LC um, with patterns of stimulation that were similar to what we saw in VTA or in LC when the animals were exposed to novelty, um, very like the novelty that we were using in our behavioral experiments. Now I'll rush to the end because I'm conscious that time is short, but to say we did anatomy to show co-localization of um, uh, TH antibody and a, a marker for the channel rhodopsin, so we're sure we're activating the correct cells. And we also established, somewhat surprisingly, that there was a much bigger projection from Locus cerealis than from VTA to the hippocampus in the mouse. And to cut a long story short, uh, what we found was that if we did optogenetic activation of VTA, we saw very little effect at all um, uh, uh, in, the, in, the relative, in, the, in the in the channel rhodopsin positive and the control animals, they didn't differ. But in the case of the Locus cerealis animals, we were able during, uh, with blue light activation 30 minutes after encoding in the same behavioral task as I presented to you, we were able to find good 24 hour memory uh, later, as you can see, in the data here. So here's the forgetting after 24 hours when you have the light off, turn the light on for five minutes, analogous to novelty, then what you find when you look 24 hours later is that the animals can remember the correct location of the sun well that had been exposed to 30 minutes earlier. And the, the data on the right is the, uh, the um, EYFP controls. Now we went on to look at the impact of propranolol and shearing and found uh, in some ways to our delight, but also a uh, surprise that there was no effect of propranol and a striking effect of shearing 23390. So that fits, uh, the, the pharmacology fits with our earlier behavioral data, 
but we have this paradox that although we're activating noradrenergic neurons, it's a dopamine antagonist in hippocampus that blocks the effect. And we're still trying to understand the basis of that. I recognize it's only pharmacological data. I'd love to be able to measure directly dopamine release from noradrenergic terminals in hippocampus. And we began such a project, but we had to abandon it, unfortunately, uh, for, for, for personal reasons at the lab that we were working with. So we'll come back to that uh, in due course. So to conclude, what I presented to you is something that I just call as a sort of buzz phrase, silent learning. Um, which is the idea that there's some paradoxical impact of very low doses of muscimol that's permissive for LTP induction and also new memory encoding, but, but because it blocks cell firing, it masks the learning that's occurring. And so that leads to a possible interpretation to the effect that perhaps somatic cell firing plays less of a role in memory encoding than has been considered to date. So I'm not saying Hebb's postulate is wrong, but it may be a special case. And then second, with respect to novelty and so enhancement of retention, that's set against the background of a theoretical position to do with the idea that most of everyday memory just happens automatically. There's a risk that the whole system becomes saturated. That's solved by it being rapid trace decay, but that gives us a window of time in which the uh, consolidation mechanism, such as the overnight consolidation mechanism, can pick out the things it wants to keep and we've tried to uh, look at that experimentally by examining the impact of environmental novelty given 30 minutes after memory encoding and shown that that can uh, select out a memory that might have occurred just shortly beforehand to be worth keeping. And this novelty effect can be mimicked by optogenetic um, LC activation. So perhaps cellular consolidation acts as a kind of low pass filter into replay and systems consolidation, helping to limit uh, the consolidation burden during sleep. Obviously, the noradrenergic dopamine dissociation needs careful follow-up. So um, um, uh, I'd like to thank the various people who played a key role in some of these experiments. Um, uh, Janine Rosato from Brazil, who did the silent learning work, um, and um, uh, Tomonori Takeuchi and Adrian Dushkovitz, who did um, the optogenetic studies. So uh, thank you to you all. Thanks to the Institute for your leadership over the years, and of course, to the great man himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for this uh, nice and um, exciting uh, presentation. These results are um, um, very understanding, particularly the optogenetic um, results that you presented. This is really parsing how the um, locus cerebellus neuron, the neurogenetic neuron, so the stimulation of the neurogenetic neurons in the locus coeruleus um, make these um, big um, improvements in, in, the, in, the, in the memory retention. Uh, well, it is really puzzling that this is um, uh, inhibited with the, with the sharing compound. Yeah, yeah this is very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are going to pass on the, there is um, a question so, here. Yeah. Sure. And there is also a question from Johannes Graf that uh, raises his hand. Okay. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, beautiful talk, uh, Richard. So the uh, the tag. Um, what is the tag? Where do you? Where do we stand on knowing what the tag might be, and how how does it attract the uh, the other components of the of the synapse? Um, I think the bottom line is we don't know. Um, but um, there are probably several different components. I doubt, you know, initially Fry and I thought, well, it's the phosphorylation of one particular protein, but that seems very unlikely. Um, uh, Redondo and I did a review some years ago, and we wondered whether uh, the destabilization of the um, actin cytoskeleton of the dendritic spine may be something that could be a factor. This is necessary for the uh, insertion of additional AMPA receptors. And so there's a sort of process going on there. And um, that could be something that marks out a particular synapse as, as it were, um, permissive for the entry of plasticity proteins, which then stabilize that change. Now, if those plasticity proteins are unavailable, then perhaps the AMPA receptor trafficking just settles back down into the sort of baseline stage and you end up with the same number of AMPA receptors as you had at the first place. So 
Our thinking is that it's likely to be structural um, rather than a specific molecule. Um, and, you know, I've been wondering whether with some of the sort of amazing new technologies uh, that people like Daniel Choquet in, in France have for looking at um, uh, dendritic uh, uh, structure would be appropriate. But of course, you know, his work's all done in culture. So, you know, we've got this constant mismatch between what we want to do and what the technology yet allows us to do. So I, I can't really answer your question, but um, uh, th that's, that's our, our thinking so far. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question from uh, Cristina Martin Monteagudo, who he asked that you mentioned before the fact that forgetting comes to rescue yeah. after storing everything for a while. And, um, and she says that you focus on LTP and she wonders what is the value of LTD regarding memory retrieval. Well, LTD must be important too, um, uh, regarding memory storage even too. Um, uh, I suspect that there may be a difference between hippocampus and cortex here, uh, in that LTD is much easier to um, uh, induce in cortex. But in the adult hippocampus, LTD is quite difficult to get. Um, you can get it, um, but it's difficult to get. And my own kind of hand wavy um, interpretation of what's going on here is that the kind of intellectual framework I'm coming from is supposing that the thing gets wiped clean over a period of, you know, not necessarily one day, but a few days, so that what you want is a low baseline when traces decay down to that baseline, and then LTP giving you high signal to noise ratio. And LTD would not necessarily be particularly helpful in hippocampus. In cortex, however, it's a whole different picture where you want to kind of maximize storage. And we know now from various computational neuroscience models that having both LTP and LTD is a way of maximizing storage. So uh, I'm sorry if by not mentioning LTD very much, I've sort of seemed to imply it's not part of the story. I think it probably is, particularly with respect to cortical consolidation. So uh, do you think that LTD also uh, plays a role in um, forgetting? Um, there is a book by um, Borges about the Funes de Memorion. <laughs> <That's who could laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, the, the, the may, I mean, the, the, there have been quite a number of both human uh, experiments on active forgetting and others looking at um, uh, 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 compounds that actually interact with LTD. Um, uh, there's a group in British Columbia, Yutan Wuyang, has been looking at that very actively, particularly with respect to tasks like novel object recognition and object place memory. And so um, there, may, there may well be some active forgetting induced by LTD, but then it's, it's likely to be a, an interference effect rather than a trace decay as such. Okay, well, thank you very much, Richard, and then we will, should move on.